my name is Andreas Kuhlmann. I'm um, Senior Vice President of the uh, R&D organization in Coverity. Just very shortly on the agenda, I want to quickly go to an introduction, talk just, you know, what, what actually I think philosophically what's behind um, development testing. Then just give a couple of slides at the comp company overview. Not everybody may know us as a company, just some, some of the highlights where we are currently and, and where we're going. And then specifically dive into um, Coverity 6.5 uh, which we released actually um, just a week ago. So it's, uh, it's now a week old, that product, and we are very proud of that. Um, it's a major release for us. There's lots of stuff in there, lots of good stuff on the, on the existing products, but also lots of good stuff for a new product. So very quickly, a short introduction. So if you look at, I mean, I had an experience about uh, five years ago. I worked for a different company, and I was reporting to the CEO, and that was a company we did software products. He had no clue about software. He was just, he just took over the company and he went to customers and he got beaten up by customers all the time about the quality of your product sucks, right? And he always said, oh man, I want to talk about the future and I just get complaints, right? So he, he locked me up with himself for three hours and he said, what's that problem with all the software thing, right? And so actually I explained that to, to him, this giving some comparison to actually manufacturing. And I started off that the software industry itself it's actually a very, very young industry, and we're still actually trying to figure out how to build software in a, in a, in a predictable manner, as we have learned um, in other areas. My background before I, um, before I joined Coverity and uh, before I joined Cadence, I was uh, for a long time at IBM, so I was uh, a lot involved in hardware verification, so I was uh, very much doing a process of verification, you know, the stuff that, that, that we never blame, then it breaks, so if this computer crashes, we don't blame Intel, right? We blame Microsoft, right? And there's actually a message for that. The message is hardware verification over all the years has become much more rigorous than software verification. And always when I talk to customers, I think in software verification we are just 10, 15 years behind that. But we will get that same rigor in software uh, because it's needed now, because there's a business pressure there. And you heard a couple of talks before, and, and I'm sure we're going to hear more. There's a lot of pressure from a business side to essentially make sure that software is reliable, that software is secure, and that it's delivered with a high quality. If you just look at this from a manufacturing point of view, I mean, if you look at before we went to mass production, right? I mean, this is just some carts, right? Some horse carriages um, that we build, you know, manually, one by one, right? I mean, we would start from one piece at a time. We would file it maybe from one. Everything would be custom made. You know, it's fairly unpredictable, you know, the cost. It's fairly unpredictable when we actually deliver a particular piece. Um, and then we went to, to mass manufacturing, right? Um, you know, a lot of people always quote the enablement of mass manufacturing as specialization. You know, we put people on, on the line and so on. I would claim that one of the prerequisites for that is actually quality control at every level, right? Today in, in, in automotive industry, it's very often called total quality uh, control. So we're on every level. We start from a screw, you know, then we screw the next piece together, maybe an engine, and then we put the engine in the car. On every level, we do quality control. We measure every aspect of what's right and what's wrong, and we pass only the parts that are right, and we don't pass the parts that are wrong. And that way, we are not taking a car, building the whole car before we test any piece and take it on the road, and we'll realize, you know, the wheels are falling off and, you know, the roof comes off and so on. No, we're actually able at the end to drive a car fairly safely because we did a lot of total quality control, you know, on the way. And as I mentioned before, the key is really the quality control of every level from the screw, you know, to the engine, to the doors, to the car itself. I would claim software is actually not much different, right? But if you look at, and I realize here when I talk to customers here, I always find it very surprising that in Europe it's a little bit more ahead actually, at least on average when I ask um, about the methodologies that people do for, for, um, for software development. But a lot of shops that I visit, they're still in a very traditional QA based cycle, right? I may have, you know, a six months or a full year um, release cycle. So I'm doing all the development, then when I'm done with development, I'm passing all the code over to some QA organization. If I have some security concerns, I may have some security people looking at security, and then you start testing it all. And when you come to the QA cycle, essentially, you know, you don't really know, right? After whatever, like four months, five months of development, I mean, you're having a big gamble. You get into issues like you don't know whether you're really gonna make it. So you have two choices, either you sandbag a lot with your boss and you just put a lot of buffer in there, 
or you just take a chance. And, and at the end of the day, what very often happens, when the ship date is fixed, you just ship, right? You know, put the lipstick on the, on the pick and ship it, right? And that's very often what happens. You close your eyes and, well, we're going to deal with the field issues when they come in. But um, this is a much more traditional way of doing software development. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, agile and you're getting actually much more the testing itself of the software in the inner loop. So essentially the idea, what a lot of people, you know, when, when people talk about agile, I mean, for me, um, I personally have done this all my life in coding. I always was integrating, you know, testing in the code development. But for a lot of people that was new and the agile methodology, you can, we can argue for people that are a little bit older, that's just BS, right? A lot of that is just, you know, finding nice names. But there are two things I think that are, that are very nice about agile. One is just operationally, they're kind of nice terms, you know, you have two week sprints and you know, have a scrum master and you have daily stands ups and all this kind of stuff. It's just good best practice. But the most important thing of agile, which actually many companies and many customers that I talk to don't do, although they claim to do agile, is whenever I'm done with a feature development this, in the smallest grain level, I have tested that feature completely and I do accept the feature only when all the tests are passing. Because what this gives you really, that gives you really this momentum that at any point in time, I know my code is, you know, at least to the degree that I developed it, to the tests that are, that, are, that are passing, is correct. And when I get to the next feature and then change some code that I needed from before, I have my tests in place. They are now, they are automatically run. They are now regression tests, meaning they would pop up in a second, you know, if I screw something up on the way. So this is really the key idea. Of, of driving testing in the inner cycle of development. And I would even go further. I would go further saying you want to have it almost at the same time when you compile the code. And the reason is because we all have very lossy memory, especially when you get older. I mean, you can memorize less and less and less. And when we do a piece of coding at that moment, we have that piece of code in mind. I mean, a week later, it's already foggy. A month later, it's rather obscure. A year later, we may say, what an idiot has written that code, yeah. although it was my own code. <laughs> right? So writing the test right at the time when you actually write the code is just from a raw efficiency from our own memory processing, a good practice, besides all the other reasons that I mentioned. Right? So what this really means is, it means there are tools involved, there are processes involved, and there's culture involved. It's a change of culture. I want to tell you a little bit about our own experience. When I took over the R&D organization at Coverity, I landed exactly in this picture up, to, up there on the, on the left top. So I had a QA organization that was outsourced to Eastern Europe. It's 15 people over there. Um, we did a QA cycle at the end of development, and I was just putting you know, my fingers crossing and, and, and hoping that you get the release out. So in, the, in my first releases that I did, I just did the traditional sandbagging. So I pushed back on all the features, said I need enough time to, to learn essentially how the process goes. But then I dismantled actually that QA organization and built up as the same resources in team in Canada. And these are all test engineers. Their job is not to do a QA cycle at the end. Their job is to write tests as the developers actually write the code. And we are now big time through a lot of automating our entire testing process and making this interleaved in where we actually do the coding. So there's a lot involved. It's tools involved. Is, but it's mostly also culture involved, making the, res making the developers responsible for essentially saying your go code got to be right. It's not someone else's job to, to find that. So just to, this was a short introduction, just quickly about us as a company. Uh, the company was founded um, in 2003. It came out of the research lab at Stanford from Professor Dawson Angler. Um, he was actually looking at a lot of the static analysis research that started with Lint, many of you know Lint in the, in the 70s, was incredibly noisy, not really very useful at that time. So he actually did some deep um, semantic analysis, into procedure analysis, these kind of things, came out with a great research project, had some customers, um, in it, or had some actually industrial partners, and they were saying, we want to use this in production. I mean, how ca can you guys um, support us? And you know, so university cannot really support any customers. So they came up really with, um, with founding a company on that, and we are very lucky. Actually, still one of the founding members, um, Andy Cho, he's our CTO now. He's still with us. He's the last guy we, we keep him. We tr try to keep him as long as possible. But the company really uh, started 2003, was not taking any venture capital till the, uh, to, uh, till the year uh, 2008. The time raised just $20 million, was the only time um, we ever raised money. 
And since then, we are, we are cash flow neutral on purpose, meaning we actually, what you see down there, we are investing 33% back into R&D. So we're actually growing the R&D organization fairly aggressively. There's a reason because we want to build out our product portfolio. And overall, as a company, we, we are doing very well. And I think the, the fact, um, what I attribute that to is this, what I indicated before, the shift in the way software is developed, I see really much broader now. I mean, you see a lot of shops, um, I don't want to mention specific companies, but when you go in, it's rather scary how they develop software. And you really wonder, you know, what the software is, uh, is doing at the end of the day when it impacts your life. But there is a huge shift going on right now. So and we as a company, we see us right in the center of that shift. So enable essentially that shift from a tools perspective, from a flow perspective, but as well as from a, from a, from a culture perspective. Um, this is just one summary. This is a nice picture actually summarizing what we are all about, right? You have development there. You don't want to have the bugs, you know, escaping development. And you can put any cost factor in there. I think actually 10x in Q8, 30x in the field is, is probably a big understatement. I mean, depending on where you are, in safety critical code, I mean, a field escape in, in, in a medical device uh, may cost you millions and millions of dollars of a tiny buck, you know, that you could have found earlier. We're very proud of, also that um, the, the Mars rover projects, actually the entire history of the Mars rover projects, we're using Coverity. So the Curiosity um, rover that's up there is completely Coverity clean, including all false positive. They clean out everything. These guys are incredibly paranoid. Made, I mean, I, I, I was up late and I watched the landing. I mean, it just made, you, made it kind of cool, right? And we as a company we felt, felt kind of cool, right? Besides all the other customers that, that we have. So if you look at um, the history of our product releases, because some of you may know, not know that. And before I want to talk about 6.5, I want to give you kind of a little bit of an idea where we are coming from. So as I mentioned, in 2003, the company was founded. And um, there we are today, 2012, with a 5.5 release. So it started really with a research project that was released as a product in 2003 was fully focused on, on, on CC++ analysis, uh, had a fairly limited number of checkers at the time, but did find some good stuff. You know, stuff like buffer overflows, you know, null view references, and so on. Then later, um, in, 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 in a few releases later, we added, uh, we added a Java analysis, and we added c -sharp analysis, and built another product that's called a dynamic analysis that's for Java, actually finding race conditions if you have a multi-threaded code and you have locked um, you know, your variables properly, so we would find essentially the situation under which you may have non-deterministic behavior in the code. And then the 5.0 release was a major release about uh, two years ago, no, three years ago, uh, which was a new generation actually of our UI. It was a modern web application, completely redesigned from scratch, it supported a whole number of new workflows that were really learned by us in the past years. For example, a lot of uh, customers have many, many branches in their code. So you want to be able to deal with these many branches in an efficient manner that when one developer in one branch triages the code, in, you know, a defect in one way, you want to share that with other develop developers and so on. So a lot of workflows were supported there. It took us a few generations from 5.0 to essentially catch up with all the functionality for, for 4.x. Um, meanwhile, uh, since several releases, we are actually up there. And today, um, we are very proud, essentially, to, to, to release 6.5. So 6.5 has not only some major enhancements that I'm going to talk about, about the, in the existing product, it also has um, two new products in there. One is web application security. So specifically targeted for Java web application, finding uh, security vulnerabilities like a SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and the colleagues of, from SAP they managed that um, before as one of their top um, in the company. But also understanding actually the application in, in a very deep manner. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then another product that we released is called Test Advisor. And that moves us actually out of the static domain also in the traditional dynamic testing domain. So Test Advisor helps, helps some development organizations to write better tests and to focus the test on really what matters. In terms of you can set a test policy, the test policy gets, gets, gets validated and checked every time you're running your build or every time you're running your test. And it becomes part of the same workflow that you already have for static analysis. So, you know, developers are familiar with that. They see kind of defects and so on and so on. I want to mention one thing, and this came up before. Through all, all the years 
the development was completely driven by customers. One of the, um, one of the things about source code in practice is you can generate all kinds of artificial examples. And then with these ex artificial examples, compare tools, you know, tool A versus tool B, whether they find, uh, you know, this, this, this um, <coughs> you know, created a defect in, in some code. What really matters is what happens in the, in the field. So we are scanning as part of our testing strategy, we are, we are scanning every week 60 million lines of code from the open source. We have them triaged, all of them, we compare the results, we make sure we don't miss any defects, and that any new defects that we are finding are valid defects. So we also have a very good um, collaboration with many customers. So and I would like to invite you all, whenever you find you know, that we didn't catch a defect or there's a false positive somewhere, please send us a, a, a code snippet. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to send a code snippet. You need to maybe change the variable names and so on if it's, if it's confidential. But, uh, but, but Rüdiger was giving the example with SAP. It was, a great, it was a great learning lesson for us where we essentially, oh yeah, that's actually a class of problem that probably not only SAP has, there are lots of other customers. So we generalized that, developed a new checker, and hopefully we're gonna release it um, in one of the next releases. So if we talk about, you know, getting as a company, it, having a product that's successful on the developer desk, there are a whole number of ingredients which I would like to spend a few minutes on. It's not only f about finding defects. I mean, finding defects is really just one sliver of the overall problem. So there are really multiple aspects. The first one is the results have to be on very high quality. What that means for us, they need to be very relevant defects, defects that are very hard to find with other methods. And moreover and most importantly, the false alarm rate or false positive rate has to be very low. And that has to do with the fact, I mean, any developer, if I, gi if I give a developer a tool and he runs a tool, he finds the first defect. He looks at the defect, it's a false positive, it's not really a defect. I said, okay, I forgive the tool. The second defect you're looking at, it's still a false defect. The, you know, you get nervous as a developer. After three, four, you're going to your management and you're saying, forget about it. I mean, it's wasting my time. Do you want me to develop features or do you, de do, do you want me to chase these stupid bugs that this, that this tool is, um, is, is, is generating? So this false positive rate is one of the key criteria for us. So on average, we have normally with a well-tuned setup, anywhere between five and 15%. Um, we sometimes go to 30%, but on average, most of the time, we are below 20%. What that means is, out of 10 defects, eight defects are real defects that are recognized by the developer and say, yep, I should take care of that. They may not take care of that right away, but recognize that's something that is important to do. The second ingredient is, it needs to be easy to understand, and I think there was a very good discussion um, during the SAP talk, particularly in security. It's you have to present a defect in a way that a developer can immediately understand that. So our goal is that any developer can do triaging between three and five minutes, meaning within five minutes, I've looked at the defect, I understand whether it's a real defect or false positive. If it's a real defect, I know what to do about it. And when we talk about web application security, anyone who has ever looked at the cross-site scripting defect, it's rather non-trivial. And so we are very proud actually that what we do in the product, what we do, we give very good remediation advice to the developer. This is what's wrong with your code and this is what you need to do to fix it. Very, very important. <coughs> Developers are not security experts. Good discussion about the training and I applaud SAP that they train their developers for security issues. Most organizations cannot afford that. So they have to essentially rely on tools that the tools explain to them in plain words that a developer can understand what the issue is. The next ingredient is it's very important to fit into the regular build process. That also came up at, at Uwe's talk. So if you do a nightly build, we have to run at night. If we wouldn't do this, if you run like three weeks or whatever that is, you get off cycle in your development process. People would say to me, okay, once in a while I look at this tool. And once in a while gets forgotten. And then once, you know, we are at the end of the release cycle. And before we know it, we ship essentially defects because we don't have the time to fix them. So it's critical that the performance of our product is high enough that we can essentially run it as part of the build process, either in continuous integration or in a nightly run. 
And uh, we, what, what we just released um, about a year ago is parallel analysis. So parallel analysis gave us a huge boost in terms of the performance speed without losing any determinism. That means you know, that the results are always reproducible, whether you run it on a single machine or on a multi-core machine. The fourth ingredient is it needs to fit in a developer workflow itself. So for example, developers very often want to do something like clean before check-in. Clean before check-in is a very interesting psychological um, aspect because most developers are embarrassed about their bugs, right? We don't want to show our bugs to others. So I would like to have a workflow where I can clean out my bugs before anyone, anyone sees them. So for that, you need to have a desktop workflow with local analysis that we support, including the corresponding ID integration. And the last one, equally important for management is you not only want to have your developer using these tools, you also want to be able in your organization to set policies and to monitor the progress of your development. So you want to have corresponding dashboards. You would like to be able to set a policy, for example, the maximum defect density on the code covers that you would like to achieve, and so on and so on. So these are, if you look at us from a product investment portfolio, so we're not only building checkers, we're investing in every one of these aspects because every one of these aspects is important to get to developer adoption. And developer adoption is critical for you as customers actually getting value out of us. Otherwise, you just bought a product and after a year or after two years, just sits on a shelf and nobody's using it. Let's talk about Coverity 6.5. And um, that is really, as I just mentioned before, that's actually a major release for us. Um, has two new products in there and also uh, some major improvements on the, on the existing products. So this is now our new, what we call a market texture. And um, I know we renamed some parts of the product. <laughs> I'm still trying to keep my, learn them myself. But, um, but I want to talk a little bit about this market texture because it shows really that our mission you know, is much, much broader than just static analysis for quality. We are really trying to get to the point that I mentioned in the beginning, you know, taking care of quality and security in the inner cycle of your development, right? So if you look at this on the bottom, this is what we call Coverity Safe or the static verification engine. This is really the foundation um, of where we build everything. This is the deep static analysis infrastructure that we have, where we can do a full-blown semantical analysis of all the code. Read in the entire code basis. We analyze the entire code basis uh, from bottom to top and we understand code dependencies, we understand semantical relationships between pieces of code, where static defects are only one little aspect that we're printing out. We're actually knowing so much more about the code that we are now using in different parts of the product. So there's three core products built on top of that. First on the left is Quality Advisor. So Quality Advisor is our traditional quality defect that we find with static analysis on C, C++, on Java, as well as on C Sharp. So issues you know, that are null pointer deal references which may cause a crash, any memory corruption, you have buffer overflows, and so on, and so on. Right? The middle part is the security advisor. Security advisor, security is quite different in different domains. In the C, C++ domain, it's much more traditional you know, server network security you know, buffer overflows, heap manipulation, you know, stack manipulation, integer overflows. These are really the issues that, uh, that, that, that our colleagues from SAP were talking about that essentially allow an attacker to execute some malicious code, get access to some directories that you're not supposed to, and so on, and so on. The other aspect is where we have a new product is a web application security. Web application today, a Java web application, is written very, very different than a C, C++ uh, code basis. In fact, I would claim it's an unbelievable mess and it's a huge step backwards in history in terms of the technology. I mean, a web application today is nothing else than massive string processing. And because we just push strings left and right around, these strings are sometimes interpreted as a command, sometimes they're interpreted as, as an XML file that you want to print on the, on, on the screen. And because people can just inject themselves or manipulate this string processing in between, it's a huge, huge area of vulnerabilities that you can have. And that has just to do that the poor choice of technology, you know, on the one hand, you know, created a lot of opportunities for vulnerabilities and hackers, you know, to get into system. On the other hand, 
creates a business opportunity for us to essentially develop tools that are, that, 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 that are avoiding that or highlighting those. Um, on the right side, you see what, what we call test advisor. This is really our expansion into dynamic testing, meaning not only you know, doing the static side, also doing the, the, the dynamic side. And the focus there is that we're using the strength of our static analysis engine to essentially give specific test advice, meaning that we can find areas where you should develop more tests versus other areas where the tests are not so important. Convert this into concrete actionable items for developers. They show up in the same way on a developer desktop as, as defects or you know, policy violations. They become essentially something that you can track as a manager, that you can assign, prioritize, and so on. So what you see around these um, three core products, that's Coverity Connect. It used to be called a Coverity Integrity Manager. That is a developer cockpit. This is essentially where he sits on a source code, he understands defects, he can triage defects, he can communicate with other developers and share the results of triage. On top of that is Policy Manager. Policy Manager is the Manager Executive Dashboard slash Policy Setting Engine where you can perform software governance in your organization. So as I mentioned before, you can set certain rules what the defect density should be, how fast people should develop tests, how much time you give them to, de to, de to, de to fix a defect and so on, and monitor that in your organization. Get actually visibility into what's going on. Particularly important in the testing domain. Most people have no clue what people are actually testing in the organization. So with this entire stack, you get that opportunity. I don't want to go into detail on the, on, the, on the left and right. On the left, what you see is a few more analysis packs um, that we have. I would like to mention on the bottom the analysis integration toolkit. So we open up actually our SIM, or formerly known as SIM, now Coverity Connect, interface that you can import defects that are like defects for static analysis in a very simple mechanism. <coughs> you can import them and then use our workflow to do this. So some customers, for example, have very simple org scripts, right, to essentially say, I want to have certain coding rules. I'm just a scan essentially scanning myself the code after certain things. I want to generate a defect, and I would like to pump this defect into our workflow because I want to have the same integration. I want to have one place where the developer needs to go to. So this import mechanism gives you that, that capability. They already, um, one is going to ship with 6.5, that is what our architecture analyzer piece. The import mechanism will already automatically pump into, into SIM or into Coverity Connect. Then we are working with a company that's called Perilosity. They do dynamic anal analysis for C++ code. This will be available soon. And right now we start talking with Black Dog. They also want to essentially import their defects into our, um, into our um, platform. So what the story behind that is, again, we hear this from customer over and over again. I don't want my developer to have three, four, five, six tools. I want them to have one tool. So by providing that import mechanism, you know, we essentially give the capability to, do, to, the, to the customers to do that themselves. Let me talk a little bit about um, the quality advisor. So the quality advisor, I mentioned that, is historically really the root um, where Coverity is coming from. This is the CC++ side. We have 79 checkers, um, all of them highly tuned over many, many years. Some of them majorly rewritten. I mean, about a year ago, we rewrote one of the core checkers, which is the overflow and underflow checkers for buffers. Uh, with much more precision, much higher true positive rate, much lower false positive rate, tracking integer indices in a much more precise manner. I mentioned the parallel incremental analysis, key for being able to run 10 million lines of code overnight. This is really the parallel analysis machinery behind that, so that we can get into this, into this inner workflow. And then uh, it was mentioned before, what's important is in order to get to a very low false positive rate is you need to do some modeling and tuning. For example, if you have your own memory allocation um, routines, which a lot of you know, code bases do, you just need to tell us what the malloc, what the free, and what the realloc is, so that we understand that, and then correspondingly modeling, model the heap as we symbolically execute the code. Um, I want to mention the Java quality analysis, because there is a major step forward in 6.5. About two years ago, we started rewriting our entire Java product from scratch. We rewrote it actually on top of the C++ stack because the C++ stack was the most advanced analysis stack that we had. So we started uh, rewriting Java completely, started doing source code analysis, and added a lot of checkers to that. So in the 5.5 release, 
in the 6.5 release, we added 40 new checkers, um, a lot of them understanding actually frameworks, um, like for example, Hibernate and, and Spring. So marking now specific, uh, specific defects because you misuse, for example, framework, or you misuse you know, a particular other pattern on that. So this is something we're particularly excited about. This is, comes very also combined with the Java um, web application security because very often, you know, security vulnerability and the quality vulnerability an organization cares about both and would like to b fix both at the same time. Here's just an example um, of uh, the Java analysis. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know Tomcat. It's a web server. Um, we use it ourselves. A, a lot of people use it. It's, it's a great open source um, a web server. Um, we just run our Java analysis. This is, this is a release that's out in the public. Uh, we found essentially 1178 bugs in there. And some of them are pretty scary. I mean, we found 37 resource leaks. So you know what the resource leaks are doing. I mean, over time, they're just eating up the memory of your, of, of your machine. And then, you know, eventually the whole process will lock up. We found 131 concurrency defects. The concurrency defects are the nice ones. They show up today. And if I want to reproduce them, they don't come back again till I ship it again to a customer. Extremely hard to find defects with any traditional testing method. Extremely hard to reproduce. So this is, this is open source. This is what a lot of companies use in, in practice. I want to actually um, show one. It's a little bit hard to see. But I want to show you one checker that we added um, actually in 6.0. It's a copy and paste checker. And everybody, <laughs> and I, I hear the laughing, right? Everybody who develops code, Yes, we are convenient. There's a piece of code that looks almost like the one we want to use. I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to paste it down there. I'm going to rename all the variables. Oops, I forgot one. We wrote this checker literally in one day. This was um, one of my the best developers was, um, was developing that in one day. It's one of the most popular checkers today because we find so many bugs in code. And this is one that is found um, in Tomcat. Right, so where people just accidentally, you know, copy and paste, and here we go, we forward one variable, right? It's just a little example of um, what we find in there. I want to talk um, a little bit about the security advisor. First of all, I mean, I mentioned that before, on CCC++, out of the 79 checkers, 32 are security relevant. So these are actually checkers, they play in the quality domain as well as in the security domain. For example, a buffer overflow, a buffer overflow is a quality issue if you overwrite some code that gets later executed and it crashes your application. But someone maliciously may exploit that buffer overflow and essentially have done the overflow in a way that he writes some executable code into that buffer, hoping that someone jumps in there later on, that the process jumps in that later on and executes that. So a lot of these checkers have actually a dual life. So what a quality issue is for one organization, is a security issue in another organization. Here, just very quickly, I mean, this is uh, the list of all the checkers um, that, we, that we have in there. And as I mentioned, about half of the checkers that we have on CC++ are security relevant. Let's talk a little bit about our web application um, security analysis. And that is a new product that we started developing a little bit more than a year ago. In fact, as we built a little research lab of, of three researchers that were particularly coming to us, joining us, to inject the knowledge about web application security because we had very little experience till that. So these are essentially people that are come from the security, from the hacker community. So people that, you know, you call some, sometimes you call them gray hats and the white hats and the black hats, right? And all of them claim to be gray hats. Nobody claims to be a black hat, right? But, uh, but one of the common things I discovered about that community is, um, you know, people are very proud to just have a high school degree and be immediately hacking applications after that for the rest of their life. So when you go to a Black Hat conference, I mean, it's all about who found the best vulnerability in whatever, you know, most known, um, you know, application and landed, um, he landed on, the, on, on, on the top of, of some uh, Wall Street Journal or New York Times. I mentioned that before. One of the challenges in web application is that the technology is actually, frankly speaking, extremely messy. It's mostly string processing. It started with HTML1 that we all saw in 93 coming out. It looked like a nice mock-up language. But then people said, oh, I want to do this. I want to execute this. I want to actually generate HTML. So we came then up with JavaScript. We came up with JSPs. We came up with all kinds of additional languages that were essentially intermediate languages that were partially executed on the server, partially executed on the client. 
And essentially all this is a goal that did some string processing. So to do, analyze a web application in the depths that's needed that you get a false positive rate, there's actually a lot of machinery that you need. And we are very proud that what you see on the bottom there, that we have built a full-blown model view controller analysis engine where we actually understand the way the web application is built. One of the aspects that's very important, for example, for cross-site scripting is you have to understand in which context you are in order to understand which string is potentially vulnerable or not. Because escaping of strings with you know, double quotes or single quotes needs to be done very different in different parts of your web application context. So if you don't understand that, number one is you cannot find all defects or you just report a huge amount of false positives. Number two, you don't actually know exactly what's wrong and you cannot give concrete explanation to the developer to fix it, nor can you give remediation advice. So as a result, you essentially have to make a choice. I, I report only a tiny fraction of the defects. It's making guess which ones are the right ones. Or I have a false positive rate, which sometimes you know, we see from some other tools that are north of 99%. And that is a tool that is great for a security analyst who can ziff essentially through all these defects, but it doesn't work for a developer. A developer cannot afford to spend days and weeks on just essentially going through a huge amount of defects, which most of them are false alarm. So what you have on top of this framework analyzer is we have a data flow engine that is essentially doing our traditional static analysis. So we find now you know, SQL injection uh, defects and cross-site scripting defects with a very high precision rate on that. We have more checkers actually in the queue for that that will find more and more vulnerabilities as we go forward. And on the right side, what you see is a remediation engine. And this is something particularly important for, for example, cross-set scripting, where you tell the developer how he or she can actually fix that defect. Otherwise, they're just easily lost in space. Right? Here, I want to give you a little example on um, what the remediation advice looks like. This is actually a SQL injection violation that you see here. And there is a concrete advice that you actually should use a parameterized query instead of just concatenating the strings. When you do the concatenation of the string, it could essentially be that you concatenate a command, for example, from a username that someone entered into a web application. All right, let's talk a little bit about test advisor. And I mentioned that before. So the problem that we're solving is, you know, we're enabling development organization to write adequate tests. And adequate tests means you're defining what that means as part of the development process. So there's three components to that. Number one is identifying the most risky code. And I'm going to talk about this in a second, what that means. This is code that you care about that it's being adequately <coughs> tested. Number two is whenever it's not adequately tested, essentially analyze it, find an instance where a test is missing, for example, on a function level, and marking it as a violation in the same way that in static analysis, it's marked as a defect. It shows up in Coverity Connect, it gets the same workflow, you can triage it, you assign an owner, it gets you know, percolated up into policy manager, meaning you can monitor the trends, you can set policies for developers, how, how fast they should write tests and so on. Um, so I talked to some of you um, before and um, many of you are actually using code coverage. So code coverage is actually a fairly common tool that people use to somewhat measure adequacy of tests, right? So the goal is, of course, you want to you know, measure 100% of the, of, the, of the code I would like to test. And there are really three problems with uh, code coverage. The first problem is I can, it's, it's almost impossible to get to 100% in, in a general case. And secondly, it's extremely hard. Once you're up at 70%, 80%, to drive that further up is very costly. So you get actually diminishing return, especially when you talk about the last 30, 20%. It's very expensive. And so you want to actually use that expensive testing time to focus on the stuff that really matters to you. The second problem you have is that not all code is actually testable. So there's unreachable code, there's dead code, they're part of your application that are not even called in the code. So this is kind of your 80%, you may get to 80%, of the 20%, you don't actually know which ones are really testable, which ones are not testable. And the third one is that of the code that you're testing, you don't know whether it actually mattered. I mean, not all of the code 
is equal in terms of the value to be tested. For example, who cares about debug code? Who cares about you know, testing code um, you know, that, is, that is very old, has been in the product for five years, and I trust much more than the code that is new? If you look at the, the way um, the architecture looked like from, from Test Advisor, there are three ingredients that we're reading in on the bottom. Number one is we're reading in from the test execution what code is actually being a test and what code not. It's very similar to code coverage. In fact, it's, we're utilizing some of the code coverage tools like GCOV, or Bullseye, and so on out there in the market. The middle piece is we're reading in the information from the code repository. So code repository give me, gives me information about the owner of the code, who changed it last, how old is the code, you know, is it code from the last release, from this release, is it code that just someone touched uh, very recently. And then the last one is um, static analysis. This is really our bread and butter. This is a deep semantical understanding of the code, like dependencies. If someone changed a function here, the change of that function here may impact some other function here. A change of a header file here may impact a whole number of other functions. That change done yesterday, I may want to set a policy. Everything that's being impacted by that change should be tested. So our static analysis can find this automatically and flag all the parts that need to be tested as a, as, a, as a requirement to develop additional tests on that, even if this has never been touched. So you may, for example, change in some legacy code that you otherwise trust. You may change some piece here, and you want to make sure that even in the code that you, that you thought would never be impacted, you want to get this identified and require developers writing tests for that. And then what you see on the right side, it's actually customizable test policy. So this is something you define for your organization. You know, that's a policy. This is how I want to enforce my testing in my organization. This is then analyzed in the middle box every night, the same way we do static analysis. We analyze it. What pops out is test advice. This is sufficiently tested. This is not sufficiently tested. So it essentially makes the whole testing problem into a black and white statement. <coughs> Either it's sufficiently tested or not. If it's not, you got to go back in and you develop some tests on that with the same workflow that we had before. We use this internally in production. Um, so we had a product, um, we had a part of our product where, which was very well tested before. We run it there um, on a dedicated experiment for three months. I had one developer looking for four hours a week at that. We found 19 bucks in our own code. What's so interesting, the 19 bucks, we didn't find all of them by writing a test that failed. About half of them we found because the developer was now essentially paid attention to a piece of code that we identified as high risk. He looked at the code and he's saying, oh my God, this is actually wrong. <laughs> I should fix that. So that is a very interesting aspect actually of testing your code. What tests really do is, I mean, they essentially compare notes what the code should do, right? The test is one view, whereas the code is another view, and either one of them can always be wrong. All right, so this is really just a, just, a, just a picture for that. What this means with Test Advisor, you can really focus your test development on the high-risk code, not on all the other code that you identify to less important. And it's particularly important when you have limited resources. You have only so many resources, or you want to start testing only new code. For example, an organization that doesn't do any tests yet, you want to start essentially saying, I am setting up a policy that every code that is new or, or that's impacted by new code I would like to have tests developed for that, all the other code I trust. A good way to get started. I can set that timeline then back over time and get back to back, you know, and, and get more and more tests over that. Um, here's just an example how this looks like from a UI. This is actually our new UI in Coverity Connect. So I don't think any one of you, unless you got access to 6.5 in the, in the last days, has seen that. So what you see in the middle here, there's a number of things. Number one is, it's indicating up there, you know, the view of particular test violations and defects. So you have test violations, you have defects. It's all in one workflow, in one UI for the user. Secondly, what you see is you see now this violation is very concretely described, right? It's essentially saying this function is not sufficiently tested because you set up that and that policy. It's naming your policy and so on. The third thing that you're seeing is you actually have the, um, the, the you can identify with these little markers on the side, which code has been tested, which code has not been tested. It's equivalent to coverage information. 
And not only that, with the number of bars that you're seeing there, is indicating the age of the code. So it's essentially saying this is very young code, this is medium age code, or that is a very old code. And you define in the policy what these age boundaries are. And um, then the last one is you can, of course, triage that in the same way that you triage other information. All right, that's probably something you have not seen from us before, and that's a new product that we are rolling out. Um, we went to um, an early access program. We had 10 customers in the early access program, got great feedback from them, great interest on that, so we are rolling it out now with 6.5 um, as we speak. I want to very quickly go through some other items. Um, the uh, Coverity Connect, is um, we actually did quite a bit of work on the front end of that. It's a complete um, UI refresh. It's a much more modern uh, web application now, the way it looks, but also the way it's implemented. It actually works much faster because we are refreshing much less off the screen, so we're not always you know, reloading the entire page on that. Um, we have now enterprise management on that for distributed um, SIM applications. And last but not least, I mentioned the third party um, input infrastructure that allows you to import anything else. Okay, so that is just a UI one more time uh, showing you. What you see also on the left is this is what we call the filter pane. So this is actually fully customizable. So you can customize it to your needs or, the, or the, you know, your, your, your user's needs on that. Um, quickly on policy manager, I mentioned that before. Now in, uh, in policy manager, you can see trends. You can see violations, not only about the static analysis defect and, and the security defects, you see this now also with your dynamic tests. You see things like test coverage, trends of test coverage, you see how many test violations you have, how long it did it a developer take to, f to finish a test violation. If you do agile and you want to enforce you know, that the acceptance finishes the test, you can enforce it all with this, uh, this, this policy manager on that. 